Good afternoon and welcome to Strategic Cereal Farm Results Week. So each day this week there will be a webinar at 12.30 until 2, looking at different areas of work on the strategic cereal farm. My name is Fiona Geary and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Manager for Cereal of Northeast. And today I'm joined by Patrick Barker, David Aglin, Steve O'Driscoll, Mark Ramsden and Lorna Cole. And today we're going to be discussing the pest and beneficials trials and the baselining work uh, for the strategic farm East, West and Scotland. So we're just going to start with some housekeeping. Uh, on to the next slide, please. So you are all muted, but we do encourage questions. So you can do that using the chat function on the right hand side of the screen. Questions will only be seen by HTB and the speakers, um, so they won't be visible to all delegates. So they will be read anonymously. Again, in the chat box, you can put your basis and the ratio details for claim points. This is only seen by us, so um, it won't be going to everybody else. We've got Maya in the background um, who's running this for us. So if you're having any difficulties, please use the chat box and we can try and help you there. This webinar is due to finish at 2 p.m. And it's being recorded. Um, all of the webinars this week will be available for you to re-watch later on on the Fields North East YouTube channel. So today's webinar is going to bring together the infield flowering strip trials carried out at the Strategic Farm East and West, as well as the pest and beneficial baselining work done at the Strategic Farm in Scotland. So to start off, I'm going to hand over to Patrick Barker to cover the background to the trial at the Strategic Farm East. So over to you, Patrick. Thank you, Fiona. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I can't see anyone. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to kick off this um, HCB Strategic Farm Results Week. It's, um, it's nice to be the first person up. It means no one can be repeating. Um, I can't repeat what anyone else has said. So hopefully, Everyone who's on this webinar has been following the journey of the uh, strategic farms, um, but I'll just give you a real whistle stop introduction of, of us, CJ Barker and Sons, Lodge Farm Westthorpe of the, um, we're the strategic farm east, we farm in middle of Suffolk, we are on heavy boulder clay, proper, um, good old cereal growing land, um, we're farming 545 hectares of our own land um, and other contracting work as well, um, alongside environmental contracting, and a bit of environmental consultancy so we've um we've, we've got enough to keep ourselves busy this is um good cereal growing land we're growing wheat barley um also great spring beans and rye grass this year the the rotation does change a little bit in, in different years but but that's where we are this year and rye grass is our kind of our main break crop um in our in our cereal rotation and for us the the conservation and the environmental management element of our farm and our farming system is really important um, it's something that we've been working on for a while. We've had a 10 year ELS HLS scheme and we've now um, got through four years of a country stewardship higher tier scheme. So as the new year comes in, we're going to be start to be thinking about what we're doing after that. And for us, everything we're doing at the moment from a farming point of view, from an environmental management point of view and looking how it all fits together kind of comes back to actually how the policy is changing and what um, what we feel that DEFRA want us to um, deliver and our farm ethos has always been to be growing the best crops we possibly can as efficiently as possible whilst delivering as much as we can for the natural environment at the same time and every decision that we make I kind of I keep thinking back to this presentation um, from when Elms was was first launched and this is the direction of travel that that I think we know we're going to be going in um, so for us the most important thing for us is uh, soil health so healthy soil is the foundation of our whole farm approach and with healthy soil, everything else falls into place behind that. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a way of farming that actually just seems logical to us as well. Um, and it's something that we really enjoy. So for me, when we look at these six targets realms, actually, this is how I interpret it. Um, and this is, this is the way I interpret biodiversity, um, reversing biodiversity in clients, in farmland wildlife, it's clean water, uh, engagement with the general public, um, climate change mitigation, protection from hazards, clean air, all those things that, that are going to be the targets. This is what we're trying to do as part of our, um, our kind of farming system going forward. Now, um, for us, the strategic farm programme 
actually has given us a really good opportunity to plan for the future. We know that direct payments are being phased out. So all the things that we're looking at and um, the infield strips are, are going to be a key part of that going forward, I think, are, are ways that we can be just getting our skills right and making sure that we're, we're getting this business in a position where we're going to be um, ready for what's coming. And I think no one here really knows what the world is going to look like, but we know that there's going to be pressure on the, the use of spray chemicals, the use of fertilizer, and in a world with less money coming in, we're going to have to be looking at all our efficiencies. So everything that we're going to be covering in this strategic farm week is, is the way we're actually looking at running our business and the things that are going to be really important to us as, um, as time goes on. And this, this is just giving us a really good chance to learn as well, because because this is going to be really important. And the way I'd summarise everything we're doing and this period of our of our farming lives is actually we're trying to give ourselves the best possible chance to thrive as a business post Brexit, because that's kind of every everything we're trying to do. So. The. The, um, the wildflower strips, the. Um, strips that we're looking at and the focus of this um, webinar today is, is something that actually we we're looking at it from a biodiversity point of view but we're also looking at it from how do we reduce our inputs and making sure that every cost that we are looking at we um, we really know what that cost is and the effect it has on the whole business and looking forwards we've got to get into a mindset where we're looking at margin over yield and we're looking at profit over production because these are the kind of going to be the fine points that we're going to um, really be looking at as we go forwards into the future. Now, for us, with these infield blaring strips, it's about it's about delivering a whole farm ecosystem. I want a whole farm ecosystem. So I want every field of, of cropped land and I want every measure that we're putting in place to complement each other. And it's building that whole ecosystem so the whole farm is working in in harmony. We can't do anything in isolation, but we need a big kind of a farm wide plan to make sure that we're delivering for all our farmland and wildlife species and we're growing the crops and, and getting the produce the best we can um, coming out of the combine um, for the markets that we're growing for. Um, and that's how we hit those targets in that first green slide that we looked at. Um, and yeah, it's good for business. And hopefully that's one of the things that will come out of this as well is that actually, you know, the it's the business element of this that, that makes it all make sense. It's not just because um, it's it looks nice it's because we like doing it. It's actually because it's good for the farm. It's good for the bank balance. It's good for the environment and it's good for the image of farming. And, and that's kind of where where we really want to be and want to make sure that we're we're ticking every box. So with these flower strips, the way I kind of summarize it is build it and they will come. So if we get these in place, they do work. And some of the the, the stats that some of the speakers are going to be showing later on. Um, just shows the real abundance of wildlife, the abundance of insects that use these strips. But actually, we need to get them right, and we need to make sure that um, we're giving them the best possible opportunity to flower. Because actually, if we get them right, if we manage them for yield of flowers or yield of insects, then we're kind of we're, we're really doing our bit. So this is the the mix that we put in. There's a lot of blue on that screen, um, and I think that the, the take-home message is that actually. You need to be getting the species that grow on your own soil type. It, the, the rest of the detail probably isn't too important as long as you've got variety and you've got species that grow. So this is a really good mixture of grasses and flowers. Um, it's flowers that, that flower at different heights as well, because if you're a great partridge chick that is about maybe two or three inches tall, you know, you need those, those squishy bugs to eat that are low on the ground. So it's all about variety in, in all the mixes that we're putting in. And this mix was actually an Immorsgate mix. Um, but elsewhere on the farm, we've got AB8 in the stewardship scheme, which is the species rich grassland in a bag. Um, and we've got oak bag mixes, which are, which are doing really, really well as well. And actually, they're not that difficult to manage if you if you get them right. So it's just a slide for the farmers, um, just so I can actually take you through the process of what we did and how we got these established. It was a, a ryegrass stubble. So it had been down for over two years um, as part of our um, growing ryegrass for, for seed. So the ground was fairly hard, so it um, had the uh, the sumo tree pulled through it first to pull it up, and then it was actually power harrowed twice because the, the ground was pretty hard. We broadcast the seed using the broadcast um, seeder unit, which is the, in the bottom left of the screen, and we actually did that twice at half rate. Um, the rates are slightly different for the grass mix and the flowers, um, so we just made sure we did got the right amount and used it all up as we went around, but it's roughly around 20 kilos a hectare. Um, 
but we did it at a half rate twice because sometimes you can get this this funny situation where all the big seeds um, sit at the top and all the little seeds work their way to the bottom when you're bouncing around in the tractor. So we kind of did half and half to try and make sure we had a really even spread around the whole field, which actually it did um, did seem to work. And some of the pictures that you'll see of these strips shows that actually as a as a technique that has worked really really well. So then it was rolled. Um, all these mixes need rolling when the seeds are in the ground just to make sure we're getting that really good um, seed to soil contact. And then there was a little bit of management after that as well. We didn't mow them as much as we might have done if it was um, a stewardship scheme mix, so maybe like a, an ex plow mix. Uh, we didn't mow it as hard as that, partly because we wanted to get this trial up and running um, and because the weather conditions didn't really um, allow that. So the, the mix didn't get mowed quite as hard as they did. So actually we had a bit of a uh, an increase in the number of thistles, so spear, um, spear thistle, creeping thistle, um, and there was one strip got treated with thistle X off the off the back of the gator. Um, so we did one one strip that got sprayed with thistle X, and the rest of it we walked it a couple of times with a spade, just digging the thistles out. And it's actually quite a therapeutic pastime, is digging out thistles. It's really quite satisfying, um, as long as there isn't too many. And it's about assessing the weed burden as well. So actually, there was enough thistles that that made it worthwhile walking, but actually didn't want to spray it. Um, so with that, we then established them in uh, the spring of 2020. And then the central plot in the, the bigger field that, that we'll look at later on um, was then actually established in the autumn after the, the last um, ryegrass crop had come off it. So we have two different generations of, um, of mixture establishment as well. So there's a bit of, a bit of difference in them but they've actually all done really, really well. And that's part of the trick of picking um, varieties that you know grow on your soil type. Uh, the ongoing management of that, actually what we did in September this year, we took it, uh, took a hay cut off it, took a traditional hay cut off it. The contractor who we were using thought oh, we were a bit daft trying to put run Heston balers up and down these strips. But I actually got four Hestons off one field and six Hestons off the other. Um, which actually shows that it was really quite a, quite a thick mix as well, and there was a lot of lot of seed that came off it. Um, so kind of that's the the summary on on how we did it. And before we move on to the next speaker, I just want to kind of leave you with a thought of of how we manage these strips, but also how we manage our own farm, and actually where I think we're going to need to be as we look forward into the future. And that is looking at our whole farm as an ecosystem and and what can we do for our farmland wildlife that benefits us and our growing of crops at the same time, but also then how can we manage all our habitats? How can we get the maximum yield of wildlife from all our all our natural areas? So our hedgerows, our ponds, our areas of scrub, how can we get the, the most out of them? And for me, it is farm like an environmentalist, manage the environment like a farmer. And I think that's how we really take positive steps forward and how we kind of hit these targets that DEFRA want us to hit in the future. Okay, so that's my introduction. Um, I'll hand you back to Fiona. Great, thank you very much, Patrick. That was a great introduction um, and really set the scene on the why behind the trials that have happened at the Shooter Farm East this year. Um, so just quickly for you, Patrick, um, in terms of establishing the flowering strips, what would you say the biggest lesson that you've learned is I think it's it's making sure the conditions are right. You know, flowers are delicate. They're kind of precious things to grow. Um, we're not gardeners, we're farmers. You know, we, we do prefer a tractor seed to a spade, um, but it's, it's making sure that you've got a really good, fine seed bed. It's not putting the flowers in too deep. Um, and it's making sure that the, the soil is at a good temperature, warm temperature, and it's at a time when you're gonna get a bit of rain to get them away as well. Um, and if you get all those conditions right, you know, flowers and grasses will really do well if you've got the right species for your soil type. So I'm not, you know, we're not saying we're putting in um, things that we don't normally find in the natural environment. Actually, what we're doing is we're looking at what we have in our wildflower meadows, what we have in our roadside verges, and actually trying to take those species and grow them on a much bigger scale. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's, it's just being sensible and not asking too much from them, but it's replicating what we've got more so and actually what we've probably lost from the past as well. That's great. And Eva is going to pick up more about establishing flowering strips and species uh, later on in the webinar. Now we're going to bring in David Aglin and he's going to give us a background to the strategic farm in Scotland. So the strategic farm 
Scotland has just started this last year um, and it's been uh, doing baselining this year to kind of set the scene for where we're going to go for the next six years of the project. So over to you, David. Good. Thanks, Fiona. Um, thanks, Patrick. That's been that's interesting hearing how you've been getting your cover, your um, flowering strips put in the ground and some of the challenges that you've come across. Um, here at Balburnie Home Farms um, in central Scotland, we, we're not as far down the line as that um, with as much detail. This year primarily has been our base lining year. Um, and whilst we already have a lot of uh, grass strips on the farm, um, varying widths from 10 to 20 metres, they're predominantly grass uh, based purely because time and management to, to get the flowering species going in the past we just haven't had the, the the wherewithal to do that so we kind of just put it in something simple and kept it like that um and most of these strips tend to be to fulfill our obligations And most of these strips tend to be to fulfil our layer-ups obligations, so next to water courses, also on the north strips or the land in the first place. So it makes sense not to try and fight nature and just let it have its way. Um, we haven't, we're not in any environmental schemes currently. We haven't been for a while, um, purely because we find they're difficult to fit around the, the business, the farming business that we have. So we find it quite restrictive. The, the schemes we had on offer in Scotland were very restrictive regarding grazing any of these um, strips at some time of the year. And going forward, as we're looking to introduce livestock, more livestock back onto the arable areas of the farm, that we felt it was tricky to do that if we were having to keep fencing off um, environmental strips and not allowing access for livestock, which seems slightly odd um, in my head. The livestock seems slightly odd um, in my head. What we haven't done is uh, we haven't benefits of these strips other than purely from um, productive and obligations to protect water courses, um, which of course is the right thing to do anyway. So we don't really know what they're harboring other than big wildlife, partridges, hares, etc. Things that we can see easily, but we, when it gets down to the smaller bugs and beasties, we really don't know. Um, and so that's been really useful with the help of um, Lorna to to get a lot of information gathered this year to kind of baseline what, what we have got. Um, as far as flowering strips within crops, we've, we've, what we do have um, is within the vegetable and root crop parts of the rotation, we do plant around the end rigs, um, uh, flowering mixes, uh, cover crop mixes, basically. Um, and we also started doing that on the tram lines of these crops through. So where the fields are bedded up and ridged up, we'll put on the tram lines, we'll sort of cover crop instead of actually putting the cash crop in there for varying reasons, including soil erosion, but also um, this sort of start look, see, you know, you know, does it bring more beneficial species in? Sort of start look, see, it can, you know, does it bring more beneficial species to the crop? Um, Given the amount of mix um, to grow with livestock as well, and that that brings an awful lot of nectar and pollen onto the farm. Um, what we'd like to do is try and learn there's, there's hungry gaps throughout the year um, where the, the insects, there's not a lot around for them. And we would like to try and find out how we can fill these gaps. There's a lot of hedgerows on the farm which help. Um, I say we're growing bean crops and pollinator mixes already as cover crops, but it still leaves some hungry gaps early in the season and later on. Of course, these will vary year to year, but if we can do our best to fill them, then we're going to help the job. Um, we don't have a we don't have as clear a steer yet from our policymakers up here to say exactly what we should be doing uh, going forward, whether it's carbon beneficials or mix of the lot. So we're a bit further behind on that front. Um, there's lots of things that we know we ought to be doing, but whether we're going to be um, encouraged or not, uh, we're not entirely sure yet. So. Um, some of the issues we've had regarding establishing these these um, strips in the past has been that wanting to graze livestock on fields and through the winter, and of course, 
not particularly conducive to the survival of um, through the winter. Of course, it's not particularly conducive to the survival of um, wildflowers and things mobbed up. Or do we make it a place have to fence them off and accept that, that we can't have access to some bits as a result? So that's a brief kind of outline of where we are. Um, as I say, Lone has been doing lots of work with our team this year to establish what we do have. And I look forward to the discussion and seeing some of the results and and be interesting to get a steer from the, the audience as to where we um where we what things we could do and ideas we could choose to, to move forward. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I think we did experience a few uh, sound issues there. So if anybody missed anything, um, please feel free to ask more questions in the in the chat, then we can uh, we can pick that up later on. Um, so thank you very much, David. So Aoife, we're going to hand over to you uh, to talk about establishing flowering strips and species selection and things to consider on farm. Yep. So just let me know when you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see your screen. Perfect. I'm just going to get a pointer as well. Um, OK, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking about two seconds there. This is kind of funny. Is that OK? Perfect. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, so species, plant species, distribution and management of the mar margins, and then a little bit about um, visual assessment of aphids, which is what this um, these three sets of trials are all about. It's about natural enemies um, for, for pest management. So a little bit of background about the three farms um, and, the, and the fields and the strips that are involved in the three farms. So um, I manage um, SF East, um, Mark Ramsden manages SF West and Lauren manages SF Scotland. Um, there's three fields um, at East and West. Um, two of those fields have margins in them. So there is one field with um, a margin all around the edge and then another field with uh, margins down through the centre and then also a farm standard with, um, with no margin. Um, Scotland is slightly different in that they don't have any established margins. Um, so they didn't uh, sow mixes as, as David was just talking about. So assessments would have been done on um, margins that were kind of naturally present, present but they're still very, very diverse. Um, and uh, Lauren and team had, they had eight fields um, to assess in that, all in, in different crops and different rotations. Um, the other key point here as well is that uh, the East, uh, which I'm looking after, um, the margins were established one year after, so after SF West, so they're a little bit further behind. Um, and that's important when we look at some of the things we measured um, and throughout the year. OK, so just some um, views, because we're talking lots about margins, but what are we actually talking about? What did it look like? So when we first went to the Barkers in November 2020, um, so here in the left is what the margins on the, um, the outer strips kind of looked like. So quite green and still quite a few flowering plants in there. So there were some daisies, red campion, um, kind of some yarrow still flowering. Then you move into um, uh, the summer and you can see this is the center margin here, really beautiful, full of grasses and flowers. Um, one of the outer margins full of oxide daisies and then um, some other species here. And we did lots of quadrats and you can see within that, just that one meter quadrats, um, the, the range of species and in, in there is probably 15, 16, 17 different um, grass and flowering species. And then on the right hand side here, we went back um, just last week actually, to lay more pitfall traps and uh, this is what one of the the outside margins looked like so you can see there's they've cut some of it back left a bit for uh, for the wildlife and then um the field itself is is on the right hand side there so that's what they look like all through the year um and again this is just what the the center margin looked like so the center margin for us was a little bit different in that it was established um later than the outside margins so the outside margins went in in uh, september 2019 and the centre margin went in in May 2020. Um, so by by November last year, bearing in mind it had been sown about five months before that, it was just starting to emerge. But a year later, it's absolutely um, brimming with with flowers and grasses. Um, get to September 2020 when we were um, deciding what to do about cutting it back, um, and we left kind of a piece on. Uh, we took away both sides of the margin, but left a strip in the middle, um, and that's for the for the grey partridge and other wildlife. So they have some nesting over the winter, um, and that's just my 
hand there where I went into the margin and tried to um, pick a number of species. And I think in about 30 seconds, I collected 17 different um, flowers and grasses. So it's really, really diverse. Um, and the ground beneath the margin is really um, quite cool and damp as well. So it's a really great place for um, biodiversity and um, insects and other wildlife to, to live in. Okay, so um, I'm going to focus on the kind of the grass and flower species that were sown um, at um, SFE, so the farm I was looking after. Um, and as Patrick said earlier, um, they got a mix from um, in Moorsgate, and they also put in um, a kg of the wildflowers for loamy soil mix because the Barkers is quite it's kind of a clay loam soil mostly across the farm. Um, and the SG1 and the SG2, um, they can a lot of finer grasses, um, which you can kind of mix in then for, for wallflowers, which you're, you're interested in for your farm. So it's a good mix, um, with a very, very diverse species range. And then SF West, um, uh, over in, uh, with the farm that Mark was looking at, this is just a visual of what it looked like from above. Um, and they had a slightly different mix there. So you can see there's some Viper's bug loss, um, some Crane's bill. But again, slightly different, but still a, a wide range of, um, of species that went in. Um, looking at species counts, so what we did to assess the species diversity in the margins was we went out in July um, and we took each margin and put nine quadrats down. So every um, half a meter or so, put down a quadrat and then counted the number of um, different flower and grass species that were within each quadrat. You can see here on the, the left hand photo, this is just two of my team from NIAB um, assessing the, the, the flowering species. Um, and you can see here in the quadrat again, like I showed before, the range of different different species that are in that quadrat. So you've got daisies, different types of fescues, um, lots of different species going on. Um, and we did that um, within the margin itself and then half a meter from the margin edge and then five meters into the crop because we wanted to look at um, whether these species start to encroach on the, the crop itself and cause a weed burden. Um, and this is just some of the results from uh, the grasses in particular. Um, and I suppose the first thing that jumps out for you is um, the, the level of rye grass. So 100 here means that there is rye grass present in all of the, the quadrats we assessed. So nine out of the nine quadrats, there is rye grass in it. Um, and if you're listening to Patrick earlier, that shouldn't surprise you because those um, those two fields were in rye grass. They produced grass for seed um, in 2019 and 2020. So you would kind of expect um, rye grass to be fairly well present in that, but less so in the center margin. Um, so that's an interesting point. But look at the range of different grasses that that um, did um, find their way through into the quadrats. So there's a huge range there. Lots of different fescues, small timothies. Lots of different heights um, and and growth timings, as as Patrick was talking about earlier. So a really good range of um, of different grasses present um, in those in those margins. Then looking at the flowering species, so the dominant um, uh, flower across all the margins really was oxide daisy, and that was really apparent when you looked at them as well. And it's not really that surprising. Um, and the same with with knapweed; these start these start to flower very early in the season. So if you go out to the margins in April, oxide daisy will be there. It's it's the earliest flower. Um, and same with wild carrot, same with knapweed. These are the ones that start to flower very early. But again, you know, a huge range of um, of diversity there in terms of the the uh, plant species that were recorded. Um, and I suppose one of the interesting things as well is that the we would expect the oxide daisy to kind of um, find its find a balance over the course of, of the of the five years that we're looking at them. So even though it's the dominant um, flower now. Um, it might not be so in, in two or three years time. And that comes down to good management of the margins and um, encouraging diversity um, over the course of the, the next few years. Because remember, we really are in only the first year of, of these, um, these margins. Uh, we also found some additional mixed uh, species there, like birds for trefoil, yellow rattle. Um, so yeah, really, really happy with the species diversity that were in there. Um, Patrick was talking about how the seeds can settle out. Um, and that's why we looked at the the nine quadrats across the margin was to assess the diversity and, and distribution of those flowers across the margin. Um, encroachment into the field. So we, at SFE, we didn't get any encroachment um, into the main crop. Um, and this is just uh, two visuals here of, of the margin. So there's a little black grass plant there. We, we don't talk about black grass at Brian's farm because he gets a bit cross about it. Um, and a little um, wild carrot there, but overall, 
um, there was there was no encroachment. And the same with the, the centre margin here. You can see the, the right hand side here, there's um, it's clean as a whistle. But um, we would expect um, that to change in year two and beyond. And that, that was kind of obvious when you look at SF West, who were a year behind us. Um, so yeah, even though there was nothing kind of um, uh, in the half a metre in and five metres in, we will expect that to change um, over the next few years. And that'll be an interesting thing to look at um, is how the flowers find their way into the crop if they do. Um, looking at SF West, so um, they did something slightly a uh, little bit different to us in that they had um, the 11 quadrats um, and a wider range of species diversity. Um, and so you can see here again, so yarrow top the bill again, a nap weed like we saw before, oxide daisy present. But interestingly, with these um, with these three fields, there was a little bit more encroachment, um, half a metre and six metre into the field. So you can see here, the F43, 0 0.5 metres in, um, you can see there was black grass, obviously, um, cleavers, a rash, wild radish, and a bit of yarrow. Um, and that's interesting because yarrow is the dominant species in the margins itself, and it's kind of started to find its way in now in from in half a metre in from the margin. So will it find its way further into the crop next year as well? Um, that would be an interesting thing to, to watch. So F43 is the field um, with the margins around the outside and the, the flowering strip in the centre as well. Okay. F40 um, has the margins the whole way around. Um, and again, so you can see oxide daisy here is the, the most dominant species within the margin itself. Um, but the most interesting here really is looking at the, the half metre and the, and the six metre um, data and looking at um, encroachment into the crop. So you've got some ladies' bed straw in there, wild carrot, it's starting to make its way in. Um, and whether that will call, move into the crop next year, it's still to be determined. But the overall messages really are really high level of diversity in the margins itself, a little bit of encroachment um, or movement of these species um, from the, the margin into the into the um, into the crop, and it remains to be determined about what will happen next year. But it should be interesting. Um, and then the field with no flower strips. Um, so kind of the main take home from here is um, it's very grass heavy. So that's to be expected because there was no um, flower sown around them. Um, a lot of clovers, rye. Um, but interesting, there there was some um, birds for trefoil and, and yarrow recorded in, in the margins. So that's a really good because it means there's there is naturally occurring flowers there to support um, your natural enemies and your ben beneficial insects. Um, and yeah, as we saw before, half meter in and six meter in again, um, you do start to you do have these um, species um, in here, but they're um, not anything that had to come from the margins. So that's really positive. Okay, and then the piece de resistance is is Lorna's work. So um, as I said before, Lorna and team up in Scotland, they had eight fields to monitor from, all in different um, cropping systems. Um, and they didn't have any sown margins, but they did have margins around the outside. Um, and what they did was, so on the left here, you can see this is the field, so Horse Park, the assessment date, so they assessed in May and July, um, and they did in the margin and then kind of half metres in. And they had 11 quadrats um, um, taken per field. And these green dots here basically are all the different weed species that um, Lorna's team assessed for. So a huge range, range of um, weeds there. And I'm not going to go through them all, um, but I am just going to show you kind of a, um, a distribution map of four of the fields. So again, this is something that you can do on your farm yourself. So um, I did a little kind of heat map to show the, the different distributions of the different plant species um, across, each, across each field. Um, and this is just four I've taken from. So you can see that there is actually quite a bit of diversity um, across the across the far the fields. So looking at Castle Heggie versus Treaton or Castle Heggie versus um, the, the bottom strip. So um, yeah, there was definitely big diversity um, across the fields and there was eight in total. So um, looking at them all, there there will be um, a huge amount of diversity. And I'm sure Lorna will, will be working with David to kind of um, look at the importance of each of those plant species in supporting um, uh, both natural enemies and pollinators, but also um, uh, other uh, wildlife as well on the farm. 
Okay, so um, key messages really from the flowering strip was uh, no two flowering strips were alike in terms of their plant species composition, and that's to be expected. Um, you uh, you get differences across fields, um, not only across farms, but even in within the the margins themselves. There's huge amount of diversity um, that happens, and that comes down to location, establishment, and management. Um, and these are the things that you know. Uh, Patrick talked talked about these earlier as well. Is um, thinking about these kind of three factors. So with location. Um, don't put, put them in where you have existing um, or near to um, uh, noxious weeds. And we saw that at Brian's this year with the thistles um, and the headache that that caused in, in thistle management. Um, if you're trying to discourage grasses, then it's better to put them on less fertile soils. Wider margins are better. So go for a six meter margin um, and that's better to avoid ingress of the, the margins into the crop itself. Um, looking for plant species that are appropriate for your soil type and climate, but actually a really good way of doing that is just to look around what you already have on your farm and what grows well and then putting more of that in. So if you've got lots of bird's foot trefoil or lots of you know yellow rattle anywhere, consider putting that in because you know it'll it'll perform really well. Um, and you can put grasses in, but usually they'll establish anyway. Um, they'll find their way in, into the mix themselves. Um, establishment, big question again. So do you cultivate direct drill or plow? Um, and what do you do with them? And we get asked a lot of questions about this. Um, if you do have a weed problem, um, we kind of say, you know, repeat the cultiv cultivations and, and let your weeds um, emerge before you go in with your with your margins. Um, and Patrick talked earlier about establishing them, um, you know, broadcasting onto a fine seabed is probably the way to go with this. Um, but I know people who do plough um, are direct drill um, and they seem to get good results. Some people have tried, tried all three um, and had massive headaches and that's, it's a lot of it is just trial and error, um, but do sow them into a warm, moist seabed, so spring or September or autumn, um, and avoid dry periods. Um, and then I guess finally is is um, the management of them. So another question we talk about a lot is, um, do you cut and collect? Do you cut and leave, or do you leave it until the spring and then pulverize them um, when they've when they've dried down? And these are just kind of different images of. Um, of uh, the Barker's farm. So two top here are what they've done is um, they've cut them back and, and taken away the hay, but left a strip as well because for the for the grey partridges, um, this is what my friend Matt sent me here down the bottom. Um, some of the, the problems if you leave the um, the mulch there is it just it just sits there and, and doesn't degrade. Um, and that can cause a problem in itself and that it rots. So if you if you have bales um, and you leave them in the field, you know what use are they if, if they if they're just going to sit there and rot down. So um, it's a big question and a lot of people don't have access to balers or they don't have access to, to the equipment um, to cut and collect or cut and leave. Um, so you can leave them there over the winter um, um, and a good way of doing that is just leave them, leave them completely dry out, get a really good hard frost in February and then just pulverize them, go through with a flailer or something and then just they'll just turn to dust. That's another easy way of, of managing them. Um, I would avoid cutting all the areas at the same time. So um, if, you, if you can, if you have the time, um, a lot of people don't, um, try and uh, spread out the cutting um, and do leave some scruffy areas. Um, there's nothing wrong with that and allowing um, some species to survive in the crop that will have value. And then other hedgerow plants um, that we don't particularly like, like hogweed and wild parsnip, parsnip, they are also very beneficial as well. So that's the um, the plant and margin side of things. Um, now Lorna and Mark will move on to um, uh, the pest and natural enemy side of things. But I've just got one slide. Um, Sorry, Isla, just before you do, we've had uh, some questions in. You've, you've yep. sparked some questions already on um, kind of more the management side of flowering strips. Um, yep. One of them is about how you would prevent oxide daisy becoming um, dominant. Um, you tend to see oxide daisy a lot in the first year, and to be honest, the best way really is just to is cutting it back. Um, and it, it, it they they naturally will peter out themselves over, over the the course of the of the the years. You see that in in um, flowering margins around cities and towns where it kind of takes over, and then it it does naturally peter out over time. Um, but there isn't any kind of main way of of um, of of keeping it at bay. I wonder, do Mark and Lauren have any kind of um, answers there? I mean, the main really, really is, to, is to catch it before it's a shed seed. So if you can get it um, before it's kind of um, uh, finished flowering and set seed, that could be a really good way of um, keeping numbers down. And we've had another question. Oh, Mark, sorry, have you got something to add in? 
Well, I was just, just going to agree with you, Aoife, that it, it, it tends to dominate in the first year. Most of the uh, these margin mixes have a, a diversity, as you've described, but they, they, that does change year on year, as some really like being those first plants to, to pop up, and others um, prefer a bit of competition. So, yeah, it, it, it's likely that they'll they'll get dwarfed by other things after years one and two and, and um, drift away. And a question probably for both of you. Um, are there any flowering mixes or species that require less management? So once you've established them, you've established them, you can kind of leave them to it. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's true though. I mean, and and Patrick will agree. You have to manage them. There's just you, you just you just have you have to manage them and. The easiest way, you know, there's there's lots of easy ways to do it. Um, you know, Roger Draycott from GWCT talks about this and about leaving them over the winter and just pulverizing them. It's way easier than having to go in and bale them and do all that stuff with, with managing. So there, yeah, there isn't any flower species, I don't think, guys, but there are easy ways to manage them, which is probably better. I would say picking species that are naturally growing on your farm. So your farm is you know you've got species that are already locally adapted yeah there, there are ways of improving grass margins that that would improve the number of flowering species that that are already there um and that can be slightly easier than starting from scratch with a with a, a designed um a designed one but you probably won't achieve quite as effective margins as you would do if you went for a, a full mix that you've designed and pulled together but ultimately these things take effort and time to to get right and and it just comes down to experience i think patrick from your experience have you noticed anything that's easier to manage perhaps rather than you have to leave it completely <laughs> yeah. You're on mute, Patrick. Thank you. Oh, I think you might be having. Try again, Patrick. Right there, we are. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> I've, I've, I've been muted. Um, yeah, I think I think the thing just to remember is that flowers are delicate and precious, and you actually have to look after them. If if you want to do very little, then you're actually not going to succeed in growing flowers very well. You know, there's there's plenty of things out there that we can do which actually don't require a lot of work, but flowers actually are the ones that they do. It's not particularly difficult, but it actually does require the timings to be right, and you actually have to get in there and 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 do it with a machine or or by hand, as you saw with my spade. But yeah, I think you you get out what you put in with flowers. Yeah, I know there'll be people on the call who have tried every method po possible of establishing these, and they have failed, and then they'll eventually find a way. So you have to fail a few times, I think, to to find the best way for you. There's nothing nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's take good advice. There's loads of suppliers out there. There's loads of seed companies who who will look at the soil type, will look at the mixes, and and come up with different things. And for the most part, a lot of the mixes are all the same, but they do come with different advice. So you know, sometimes it's actually it's looking at the advice that comes. Um, I've had mentioned a couple of companies already who I'll try not to keep plugging them, um, but we do, Oak Bank have been brilliant with us and, and every time we have a problem we can go to them and say what, what do we do and, um, and you know there's always an answer there. So I think it is just about getting it, it's, it's, it's getting good advice and getting good mixes in the ground and then working hard at them and, and flowers will come if you give them the opportunity. I think we saw that this year Patrick, it was, they were beautiful like all through the year, they were stunning. So. Uh, while I've inter interrupted you, Aoife, I think now would be a good time for a poll. Um, so Maya's going to run a poll quickly to gather your thoughts on um, measures that you would consider to promote beneficials on your farm. So uh, we're just going to run a quick poll now. You should just be able to click the screen as it shows. It should be up in a few moments. So the options we'll be giving you are flower-rich field margins, hedgerows, in-field flower-rich margins, in-field grassy strips, such as diesel banks or naturally regenerated field margins. So we'll just give you a few seconds to uh, to vote. And then Maya, whenever you're ready, um, you can see how many people have voted. We'll be able to uh, to look at the answers. 
potentially. There we go. Okay, um, so flower rich fields for margin seem to be uh, the most popular choice uh, with infield grassy strips being the least common. Uh, do these results surprise anybody or is it what you'd kind of expect yourself? Mark, does that look like what you'd expect? Um, I would say yeah. Um... Definitely. Um, again, the, it's the most, it's the expensive ones here. They're the least popular, really, isn't it? The hedgerows and the in-flower, um, infield flower rich margins um, in terms of the, the cost of managing them and the cost of establishing them. So to me, that doesn't seem too surprising. Um, I think as well, I agree. It's kind of keeping production in the field and keeping the wildlife habitats to the margins. That's typically the preference. But we'll speak about these things, Mark and I, the benefits of having things in the centre of the field as well, although it is a bit more of a pain. Okay, and we've got um, a second poll, which is going to ask you about the, the barriers that prevent you from, um, from managing beneficials on your farm. So we've got machinery constraints, time constraints, financials, or is there any schemes that prevent you from undertaking certain operations or you're just not sure what changes to make or how to make those particular changes. So again, we'll give you a few seconds. It may be multiple, but if you just choose which uh, you think is the, the biggest barrier to you at this time. I think Fiona, whilst everyone's just thinking about that, I'd say that actually yeah. the picture Aoife had there of the flower margin next to a hedge is kind of the perfect scenario for me. Yep. Because you've, you're, 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 doing, you're ticking so many boxes, you're protecting your hedgerow, usually hedges are over a ditch, so you're protecting your, your ditch and your watercourse as well with a margin. And then the hedgerow is your nesting habitat, so all those, um, the, the summer migrants that are coming in, white throat, lesser white throat, black cap, those type of species that are nesting in the hedges, they've got that real abundance of insects in these flower rich margins as well. So it's kind of linking all these, um, all these things together and making sure we're kind of getting the most out of everything. You know, a, a hedge is going to be better with a margin next to it. A ditch is going to be better protected by a margin and a margin is going to be better because it's got a hedge next to it as long as it's not shaded. So I think fitting all these things together is, um, is kind of is, is, is starting to build a much more thorough picture of, of how we manage our farmland wildlife. OK, and we've had the uh, results here. Um, it's a bit more of an even spread, but um, kind of financial schemes and time constraints, which I think, uh, again, is very understandable. Um, having heard what you've all said so far today, um, you know, they do take time and effort and as well as the finances to go into that. OK, I think we can take that down, please, Maya. Thank you very much. Okay, so it's a little food for thought for us uh, later on as we uh, discuss the results from the, the rest of the, the measures that we've looked at. Um, so Eva, I'll, I'll hand back over to you to, to carry on with the aphid identification. Yeah, I just, I've got like one, one slide left um, because Mark and Lorna are gonna um, do most of the, the insect side of things. So yeah, um, so this is all about um, natural enemies for, for pest control and talking about can we reduce insecticide? Um, and unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you want to go, um, we didn't actually have a lot of um, aphids and aphid mummies um, at SF West, West and East. Um, and these are just some pictures I took of, of the of the um, the heads, uh, the ears when we were out there um, in July this year. So we did get a couple of um, of mummies and aphids, but nothing um, that was that was quantifiable. There was really um, low levels, and that's not, not really surprising because um, at the Barkers they don't really have an aphid problem, um, and that could be for lots of different reasons. It could be because they don't really use insecticides on the farm. It could be because of their natural enemies. It could be because of um, uh, the rotations, the the climate, lots of different factors. Um, but the one thing that's really striking about um, uh, Brian's farm is the the level of um, insects that are, are are on the farm itself. Um, so if you walk around the the the, the field the fields of Brian's, you look down and the ground is just alive with uh, beetles and spiders all year round. It's just alive. 
Um, um, so there is a huge amount of um, natural enemies that, that live there. But what was really striking um, at, at the Barkers was that there was very few um, aphid predators. So the things that, um, that predate on, on aphids, so lace wings, hoverflies and, and ladybird larvae. Um, and that could be a direct consequence of there um, not being any, um, any aphids present there for them to eat. Um, so that was really kind of stark, you know, really, really clear to, and we saw that in the pitfall traps and the water traps. Um, and then with uh, Scotland, so they did see uh, a lot more aphids um, on, on different um, of the eight fields. So they had some rose grain aphids, uh, first species there, and then the, the grain aphids themselves. But they were, um, uh, the ones in bold where there was very, very high numbers, so uh, over 10 aphids per assessment point. And they did record a few hoverflies and aphid bunnies, but not that many. Um, and they were mainly found at Horse Park. Um, and Lauren, I don't know if you've got anything to add there around um, aphid numbers and kind of hoverflies and stuff at, at your site, or if you want to talk about that a bit later on as well. Um, but the general finding for, for SF West and East was very, very low numbers of aphids, um, very few aphid predators, but lots of natural enemies. Um, so, yep. So not much to add, just mainly we found um, the Toby and Avenue on the grains and um, the rose grain aphid it was on the lower leaves of the plant and it was quite taxing work because it was a very warm day and the leaves were all kind of rolled up and aphids were kind of sheltering. It was so dry this summer that I think populations may have been hit all over or I think that's a positive thing from a farmer's perspective. Definitely. Cool. That's me done. And I will figure out how to stop sharing. Great, thank you very much. We're going to hand over to Mark now, who's going to cover the water traps and using bait cards for monitoring at the strategic farm as part of the flowering ships trial. Thanks, Fiona. Hopefully you can see my slides now. Yes, we can, thank you. Brilliant. Um, so over on the west, uh, we had our three objectives. One was looking at the variation in uh, pests and their natural enemies. And then we also looked at the, the weeds in the flowering strips and, and what was coming up. And we also had a quick look at the, um, the impact of the, the strips in the field on yield. I'm just gonna talk today about um, the cereal aphids and their respective natural enemies. And as Aoife and um, Lorna have already said, um, this year there weren't very many aphids around so all the stuff i'm going to talk about now just just keep in mind that these were very low numbers um, of aphids that we were talking about now we used um various different ways of monitoring aphids in their matronomies this year uh, and i'm just going to talk about the, the 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 results we got from using water traps in the crop um, and you can see a picture of the water trap there it's a clear plastic trap so Possibly you're more familiar with um, yellow traps. We, we usually use those um, in monitoring because they attract things into them. We didn't want to attract things into these traps uh, on this occasion because what a yellow trap does is it, it signals basically that it's a big flower to a lot of um, a lot of insects. And so they'll move towards it and they'll fall on the trap and that's why you get quite high numbers. Um, but if we put that in the middle of a uh, arable field and we're particularly interested in um, natural enemies that might be looking for flowers, we're going to find all the hungry insects. So it's going to skew our data. So we use these um, clear plastic ones. So we can just find things that basically drop in and it gives us a better idea when we're comparing what's going on in different fields and, and different, um, different habitats. So first I wanted just to kind of make the case that natural enemies do make a difference because um, it, it, you could be forgiven for thinking that, that maybe there's nothing going on and, and the aphids just don't become a problem. But there's lots of research showing that uh, if you have no natural enemies around, then um, you get a very high number of uh, aphids, or rather the change in aphid population increases very quickly. And the more natural enemies are around, then subsequently the aphid populations don't grow as quickly. 
And in fact, if you get enough natural enemies, it can start to reduce the, the, the aphid population. But aphids are also limited by other things. They're limited by uh, the, the climatic conditions. Um, and it's kind of a combination of all these factors that, that dictate whether or not they become a problem and, and actually exceed the economic thresholds. Although it's worth remembering that even if an aphid population is increasing, it doesn't actually mean that it's going to be a problem. It just, just means it might get to a, a, a damaging level sooner um, before the crops kind of pass the, the um, vulnerable period. So those natural enemies are really important. They're playing a, an important role in, uh, in, in maintaining the crop um, uh, maintain the aphids at low enough levels. Um, and so we've, we um, we would take a look at them and see what was happening in, in the fields, uh, so the three fields at Strategic Farm West. Sorry, I've forgiven for keep clicking. Every time I look at my uh, slides, it, it pops off a window, so I'm trying to battle that at the moment. Um, so this is just to show you the, the average number of aphids and their natural enemies that we found in the crops uh, on the three sampling periods. So from the middle of June to the end of June, you can see that the aphid numbers were going down, they reduced by about 25% over, over the period. Um, but, and the number of predators um, and the number of parasitoid wasps was going up over the same period. So they were responding to the aphid population in the crop and they were um, having an effect, which is really good to see. Um, just to keep things a little clearer, I'm just going to focus on the most common predator we found at Strategic Farm West this year, which was hoverfly larvae. Uh, and these are a great little predator. They can eat hundreds of aphids um, before they pupate and, and emerge as adult flies. Uh, the flies don't eat aphids. They need um, pollen and nectar. So that's where the floral strips are really important for them around the crops. So you can see that the hoverfly larvae were increasing in abundance um, over the period quite, um, quite drastically. Um, but we want to know, was that different between the different crops, uh, between the different fields? And what we found was that in all the different fields, so field 40, where uh, we just had floral strips around the edge, field 42, where there were no strips, it was just grass margin, and field 43, where there was the strips around the edge, and the internal strips, in all cases, the number of hoverfly larvae was pretty much the same. But that's not necessarily a surprise um, because the adults are more than capable of flying between the fields with the floral resources to those without. These fields were not very far away from each other. Um, so it, it's, it's perfectly feasible that the adults were moving between the fields um, and, and laying their eggs in the crops across uh, where they could find the aphids that would be food for their larvae. The other question is whether when they reached those fields, did they just stick to the field margins or were they found throughout? So um, you can take a look here and see that they were throughout the field. Um, now these numbers are very low. We're talking about an average of one hoverfly larvae per trap. Um, but this was consistent through the fields, through all the fields we looked at um, on Strategic Farm West. Um, and they were also found in the internal strip and in the floral margin, um, but we didn't find them in the grass margin in, in field 42. Uh, so there it just gives a bit more evidence that those um, those floral resources are important, not just for the adults, but also that's that's where they're also active for the larvae as well. Um, and just picked out three of the most common plants that were found in the margins, in the, in the floral margins and internal strips. And I think these are three that uh, Eva talked about earlier. The oxide daisy, the yarrow, and uh, knapweed, and um, these these three were the most common floral plants to come up, uh, or most consistent across the, the different habitats, um, and they're really important plants for hoverfly adults um, in three different ways. So the oxide daisy, uh, as we we talked about, is really really common in early in, in early years establishment of floral margins. Um, it's actually not that great at providing lots of nectar and pollen. It does, does provide it and it does it consistently through the year, but the levels are quite low. However, this is a really attractive plant to, to hoverflies and other uh, beneficials. So it, it's really good at drawing them in and kind of um, pinpointing where other resources are available. Yarrow is another really good plant and this one is really good for pollen and nectar. And for beneficials and, uh, and was consistently found around. It's, it's quite a shallow flower 
Um, so most natural enemies, most of the adults can easily access the, the pollen and nectar. So it's a really good one to, to see in the margins. Um, Knapweed is a bit funny because it's actually quite a deep flower. So it, it face value is not ideal for, um, for a lot of the, the insects which have these quite short mouth parts. Um, but because of the amount of nectar they produce, uh, they often often have extra floral nectar, which means it's kind of seeping around outside the flower. So they, the um, natural enemies can, can get it from that way as well, uh, and from the buds as well before they're even flowering. So three really good species to, to see in the, in the margins, not just for hoverfly, but for lots of others as well. But the most consistent thing is that the hoverfly larvae were found in the field where the aphid prey are, and that's a really good, important habitat for them. I know we're talking about the floral margins, which, which are really important um, through the rest of the year, but ultimately most of the aphids for these natural enemies is found in the crops. Um, and that's why, excuse me, that's why insecticide applications in the crop um, you need to be carefully considered because that's where the the, the main food supply is uh, so yeah they're definitely providing floral resources which is really important through the year um, and consistently through the year but they're also somewhere where other aphids are available and they act as a refuge for a lot of beneficials as well and um, so they have these kind of multifunctional roles uh, and then in the winter they're providing winter habitat as well um, I just talked about hoverfly larvae today because time is short, but we found uh, lots of other natural enemies as well. There were quite a few soldier beetles found in the West, uh, hundreds of money spiders, um, which interestingly do use the internal floral margins um, quite a bit. And that's probably because of the, the additional three dimensional structure that you get there compared to the crop. It's a bit taller, a bit more, um, a bit more of a dynamic structure, which is quite good for web, web production. Um, ladybirds were found, um, particularly in, in the field with both internal and margins, uh, and parasitoid wasps were, were fairly consistent across all the habitats. Um, we didn't actually find any lacewing adults or larvae in the west, but they were found uh, at, uh, at Patrick's farm in the east. Um, the other thing to say is that, that of all the habitats we looked at, whether it's the crop or the margins, the floral margins consistently were used by all of the natural enemies. Um, compared to the grass margin particularly. So just thinking about what you, you can be doing on your farm, and I saw in the poll, um, it, it is tricky to know exactly what to do. And I think roughly a third of people weren't sure what the, the steps were to take. And we looked at three different farms as much as possible. We tried to, we've, we've been discussing between the three of us um, what was going on. But the, the main thing that we can see is that those three farms were all very different. I know that sounds obvious, but they've got different management styles. They've got different things they're trying to achieve. Um, there are different stages of establishment. They're doing things in different ways. At, um, at Strategic Farm West, um, they put in field margins, not just on those two fields, but farm uh, fields across the whole farm, apart from that one they excluded for this work. Um, whereas on the uh, east, those floral margins only went in on those two fields. And so you've got a completely different dynamic of resource availability at the, at the kind of multi-field level going on. Um, and all those things just mean that it's very difficult to compare what one person is doing to another on different farms. So you really have to think about what you are doing on your farm, what you want to achieve and design it, as the others have said, to your conditions, your soil, to your landscape, and to make these things work effectively. Just to reiterate, the, the number of aphids we found and associated with natural enemies was pretty low this year. Um, so it's, it's difficult to draw huge conclusions. But what we found was consistent with wider research. They were using the floral margins and they were enhancing the, um, the impact of natural enemies. Um, but these margins do change over years and they, their, their role is really spanning across uh, years and across fields. So it's not sensible to look at the individual fields in isolation. Um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so you've mentioned that between the fields, you know, it's hard to compare. I was just wondering if somebody were to try using 
flowering strips or margins on their field um, in their farm. How would they monitor if over time they are having an impact and if, if they are working? Yeah, it's, it's a really, it, that's very challenging. Um, because to do that effectively, the amount of data you'd have to collect is is um, quite staggering, really. Um, I mean, th th there are kind of different ways of doing it. One is to, to look at the margins themselves and just make sure that they are providing the resources that uh, are needed. Um, so you're just making sure they've got that diversity of plants, that they are flowering as consistently through the year as you can make them um, perform. Um, and that they're, they're you know, providing other resources, the, the winter habitat and things like that. So if you know your margins are providing those resources, um, that's your kind of first step to, to knowing it's working because that's what you're trying to do. In terms of seeing an impact in the, um, in the pest abundance, that the amount of monitoring is, is probably beyond what anyone can do um, just on a farm because you'd need to have a base level and then you'd need to monitor over time and see the changes in um, aphids um, or other, other pests uh, and see how the populations change. And you'd have to consider how the weather's impacting that. So it, it is really, really tricky. Um, so you can just go right to the other end of that and make sure you're uh, using the thresholds for treatment. And if you can just see how frequently you're, you're having to respond um, and apply things because you, you succeeded that threshold, you might see that goes down over time, or you might see that you just never, you never exceed it or something like that. And that'll give you an idea that it's working as well. Great. And we have another question. Um, how can you improve established grass margins with wildflowers? Yeah, there's a few different ways of doing it. Um, I mean, one of the challenges with established grass, grass margins is that grass is really, really competitive. It doesn't really like anything coming in. So what you've got to do is you, you've either got to um, make space for it. So you've got to, uh, I think there's been some work on scarification. You're just basically ripping something out, making some space for the, the plants and then um, broadcasting over the top of that. It's no good just broadcasting onto the grass. That, 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 it's just throwing money into it. Um, you've got to make the space in the soil, get the the, the bare ground, um, and then and then it should, they, they, you should get some establish, establishment in there. Um, the other way of doing it uh, that I've seen people do is with um, oh, I, uh, I can't remember the name of the kit, but you can not direct drill, but you basically make a path through. So you can make lines of strips of small strips of margin within the margin and do it that way. Um, and that can work, but it's also about mowing and, and things like that. If you can keep mowing it down, uh, that'll help some of the other plants come through. But, but Patrick, I'm sure you've got um, experience doing this as well. Yeah, we a year or two ago, we set about working out how we could take every bit of grass on the farm and actually enhance it floristically. Um, so the areas that were just historically grass have been mowed, um, not really managed, or just had a hay cut taken. We actually um, used green hay, so we took um, a cut from our village green, which is a county wildlife site, uh, species rich wildflower meadow, and cut and baled it on the same day. And on the areas that we'd taken a hay cut from, we then unrolled the green hay and let it dry out. And as the, as the, the wildflowers dry out as part of the hay, the seeds then drop down. Um, and that's how we, were, how we populated our existing grassland. Um, so there's another a relatively simple way of doing it. It's, it's fairly labour intensive again, like all these things seem to be, but there is another way there. Um, and you can, if you can just broadcast seeds in, but although that native source is always better than that bag mix, um, if we can. But but we, we we took the view that we actually we wanted every bit of grass on the farm to have as much in terms of its uh, floral diversity as we could, and that's um, that's something that we've worked quite hard at. Great insight there, thank you, uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to pass over to Lorna. The questions are coming in thick and fast, which is great. Keep them coming. Um, we'll hopefully have some time at the end, and if not, we'll um, we can pick up the questions at another point. So over to you, Lorna. So people should be able to see my screen, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, we can see. Thank you. So I'm going to go over the results from the pitfall traps and the solitary bee nests. So pitfall traps are a great way of surveying ground active invertebrates. And that includes the pests and also the predators of these crop pests. Really easy to use. You simply dig a hole and put a plastic pint pot or yogurt pot into the ground 
and add a little salt solution as a killing agent and preservative to process simply pour it into a tray and sort it into the different types of insects so it's not essential that you know exactly what types you can still get a good idea of what's happening by roughly identifying your insects so you can group them into big spiders and little spiders for example we survey in May and July and we leave the traps in place for three to five days. So if has already spoken to you about the sampling design, so I'll just go over it quickly. Um, in Scotland, we were baselining the entire farm. So we had eight fields. In the east and west, they were more surveying how these interior field margins can promote natural enemies inside the field, so these interior strips, and they surveyed more frequently in July. In all our sites, we had a, a margin transect of three pitfalls and then a field transect of three pitfalls. In the strategic farm west and in two of our fields in Scotland, we had a second transect in the field that was 10 metres from the margin. So to try and look at dispersal, and that's an aerial overview of those um, transects. Now, as mentioned before, the strategic farm in west also had one field where they had this interior flower strip to try and look at how it was impacting on the beneficial insects. So we were very busy this summer. Collectively, we identified over 10,000 insects, and that was across all three farms. And these are the results for the richness of invertebrates, a measure of diversity against the position in the field. Now, in Scotland, remember, we were focused on surveying in May, and we can see in May that we've got a much richer community of invertebrates in the field margins than in the field centres, or indeed 10 metres into the field. This trend can be seen in July in the east and the west, and in the west farm, you can see this gradual decline in the diversity of insects as you go from the margin into the field centre. Quite interestingly, both interior strips tend to be supporting similar richnesses of um, insects as the field margin. And this is particularly the case for the west, where the strip had quite high richness of insects. These are the results for our wolf and money spiders. The wolf spiders, the guy at the top, he's a big chunky beetle. You quite often see them scurrying along bare ground, quite often with an egg sac. And below we've got our money spider, a much, much smaller um, spider. And this spider is a pioneer species. He can disperse through ballooning. So he throws up a little silken strand and that strand catches the wind and he can quite quickly disperse around the countryside. So when we look at these two different taxa of beetle, we can see quite clearly in May, the wolf spiders are restricted to the margins. We hardly go any in the field. Um, they're beginning to disperse into the field. We can see them 10 metres, in, but not in the field centre. Whereas the money spiders a lot more ubiquitous. It's all over. So it's already in the field centres in good numbers in May. And when we compare this to the east and west in um, July, we can see again that the wolf spiders, they prefer the margin habitat, although they are in the field centres 
by July. Again, we can see the interior strips are supporting quite good numbers of these wolf spiders. Now, if we look at the money spiders, the bottom graph, again, what we're seeing is these tiny little money spiders are all over the fields um, throughout the year. And that indicates that these money spiders are present in the crop, controlling pests throughout the growing season. So from May to July, these wee guys are in, they are doing work. And now we've got results from the ground beetles. So ground beetles in Scotland in May, quite similar abundances throughout the fields and the field, the field margins and the centres. Um, in the east, a similar picture. We can see good numbers in the interior strips, similar to that of the margins. In the west in July, it's quite and interesting, we appear to be seeing this trend where these ground beetles are increasing as we go from the margin into the centre. However, we can see the error bars are showing a lot of variability in this data. So we've got a lot of um, impacts that's simply due to differences between fields rather than the margin versus the centre. Now, as I mentioned in Scotland, we had very similar abundances in May in the field margin in the field centre. So we're going to delve into this a little bit deeper to see what actually species were present. And the first guy, we can see this large ground beetles. He's very striking. He's Carabus nemoralis. He's a beautiful coppery iridescent colour. And he was very abundant in the margins, but he wasn't abundant at all in the centres. And you can see the similar trend for the next guy along Terosticus niger. So these two big species were constrained in May to the field margins. These species, they eat slugs. They also eat earthworms, so not all good, but they are, um, they'll eat a variety of different pest species, but including slugs, slug eggs. Next along, we have the tiny little bimbidian species. It's a tiny little guy. And these two species we got were both more abundant in the centre than they were in the field. And this indicates this little guy is getting into the field relatively early on in the season. And although he's obviously not going to tackle huge slugs. He'll still eat slug eggs, he'll eat springtails, mites, um, smaller prey items. And finally, you've got Nebria brevicollis. This is a very diverse um, diet this ground beetle has, and he's pretty ubiquitous. He's in the field margins and the field centers um, early on in the season. So what's going on? Why are some species restricted to the margins while other species are appearing in the centres? Is it because they have different habitat requirements or is it because they've got different dispersal abilities? We know a lot of ground beetles all overwinter in the tussocky, dense, grassy vegetation and field margins. So we'll look at that a little bit more detail. And for this, I draw on historic data from across Scotland. And these are the results for our pitfall traps in May at the Strategic Farm Scotland. And you can see that, as we've just mentioned, the Bimbidian species and the Nebria species are making up that community. These are the dominant species. Now, if we look in this, compare this to across Scotland arable fields, we can see a similar trend. In May, you've predominantly got the Bimbidian and Nebria brevicollis. Now, when we look across the season, we can see that as the season progresses, the importance of Bimbidian and, and Nebria 
is going down. So they're becoming less abundant as the Terostichus niger species are becoming more abundant. So we can see quite a big shift in the community structure as you go through the season. And what this indicates is that the Terostichus niger species plus the Bimbidian and the Nebria species, they can work together to provide continuous coverage of crop pest predators from May right through to August. So this highlights to us that Terostichus niger is simply slower to disperse. He doesn't mind being in the fields, he's happy to be in the fields, but he's much slower to disperse into the fields. And this could indicate that the presence of grassy beetle banks in the fields might promote these predators into the field earlier on in the season. Interestingly, we never see Carabus nemeralis in fields, and that's what we'd expect. These big chunky beetles are totally flightless, and they really, really like stable habitat, so they can't really cope with um, habitats such as arable fields, where there's different operations going on and disturbing the fields. So next, we'll go over the bee trap nest data. These nests are primarily aimed at monitoring solitary bees rather than our social bumblebees. And there's over 200 species of solitary bees in the UK. As we know, bees are very important pollinators and they pollinate a wide range of crops, including oilseed rape and field beans. We surveyed solitary bees by using plastic um, tubes and we had cardboard tubes within the plastic pipes. But you could simply drill holes in a straining post, that would work equally as well. We should place them in sunny open field margins, they don't like shade, and about one metre high facing south to south east. And Establish March, monitor July, August. It's easy to monitor. You're simply counting the number of tubes that are capped. So you can see these capped tubes here. Now, in Scotland, we found the tubes were capped with mud, which indicates that it's most likely masonry bees. Could be masonry wasps. So we open the tube and you can see that there's the cocoons of the bees are stacked one beside the other, and these are the cocoons following extraction. We got really low occupancy in Scotland. We only got one out of 16 locations were occupied by the solitary bees. Now, when I saw Aoife's and Mark's photos from the east and west, I got quite excited. I'm a little bit sad, but I could immediately see it wasn't mud that was capping then, it was leaves, and this indicated it's most likely to be leaf cutter bees in England. And indeed, when we opened up the tubes, you can see the water vein, the um, pupae are rolled up uh, into um, little leaf, leaf rolls. So the pupae are rolled up inside these leaves. Um, Occupancy in the English sites was much greater than it was in Scotland. So five out of six nests were occupied in the west and all the sites were occupied in the east. So we can look a little bit more at the data for the east and west. And we can see at the east there's this general trend. So fields with no floral rich margins had the lowest abundance in both sites and fields with floral rich margins had higher abundance. Of course, this is quite ad hoc information. We don't have a huge number of replications, but it's interesting to see this trend coming through. And it does show that these nests are quite successful at monitoring solitary bees. So key take home 
message. We found that predators dispersed into the fields at different rates. And because of this, this helps provide continuous coverage of these natural enemies throughout the season. Grassy beetle banks, while they might not provide for um, pollinators, they provide good overwintering habitats for ground beetles. So they might help ensure that these predators are getting into the field centres, the ones that are not so good at dispersing. They could help them get into the field centres early on in the season. Also worth noting is that these tussocky grass banks, while they don't provide forage and um, floral resources, they can provide nesting sites. We found um, that then field strips, when we've got these flower strips, they can provide forage for bees, obviously, but also for parasitic wasps and hoverfly larvae. So this would indicate that you perhaps need multifunctional margins where you're combining flower strips and bounding them by tussocky grass species to provide forage for pollinators alongside this overwintering habitat. But it's possible that these tussocky grasses might simply outcompete the flowers. So perhaps alternate strips of grass and floral margins, or even just simply leaving one or two of the field margins as tussocky grass when you're converting other margins to flower strips. So overall, diversity of habitats support a diversity of natural enemies and also insect pollinators. Thank you very much, Lorna. Uh, we have a, a question asking about the size of tubes that you were using. Did you use different size tubes to encourage different species or were they all the same? We used um, the same size of tubes. They would be a about maybe 0.7 millimetres diameter, but it is a good idea if you can get different size tubes to use um, different size tubes or even bamboo canes hollowed out would be good. That's very useful. So as we've, uh, I'm very conscious of time, and um, there are have some more questions come through. Um, but just to wrap up, I'd like to invite all of the speakers back if they can turn on their webcams. Um, and just as a final question, um, if you are going to start now, uh, everybody listening, you know, if they've not done any monitoring or anything beforehand, what would your piece of advice be? Would it be to go out and start monitoring? Would it be to tackle a, a specific pest or beneficial or try some, a flower strip somewhere and just see what happens? What, what would your next step be? Um, anybody, any volunteers to start? I'll answer that. Um, I think given that we're at the start of the journey, relatively, um, I think I'd just be inclined just to go and plant something. I mean, we've, we've got plenty of grassy strips, but we do need to put some more flowers other than thistles in them. Um, and it would be, I think, waiting, waiting to work out, see what we've got already um, is fine. Um, but I think um, back to, I think, Patrick's comments earlier on about you know, build it and they will come. I'm sure that's what he said. You know, if yeah. you if you give them the strips, give them the nectar, etc., they'll turn up. You can monitor after that, um, and then go from there. I think you just said what I was going to say, David, which was uh, which was build it and they will come. But I think we don't need to get too too locked down into looking at species and what is using them because actually, as the land the land manager. We just need to make sure we're providing all this habitat and it's providing um, a variety of habitats a variety of species throughout the whole year making sure that these margins actually um, have enough variety to support all that farmland wildlife that we're trying to promote and trying to get in there and once the habitat is right everything is there you know the wildlife will do its bit the insects will will find it and i think even we are using very simple manage a sampling technique that anyone can use the equipment's easy to source but I think 
even walking through the fields, you see what butterflies are using, the strips, you see the bumblebees, you can see what strips are supporting what insects just by walking through and looking around you. And I think, I mean, it, there's nothing I love better than walking around a farm and just looking and seeing what's there. Birds as well. <laughs> Yeah, we, we use these monitoring techniques to, to collect things and count them because we have to count and display things to kind of score it. But ultimately, you know, having a go, sticking something in the ground and going and having a look at it over the year and seeing seeing how it changes, seeing what's visiting for yourselves, that that's that's the first thing to do. Thank you. Ethan? I think also, one thing I'd also check in is actually one thing we haven't touched on is that you know, insecticides are expensive and they're damaging. And we're looking at this from a business point of view as well. And actually, we shouldn't be using things that we don't need to. You know, th th there are other options out there. And every time the sprayer doesn't go out, you know, there's a, there's a bit more money in the back pocket um, as a result of that. Yeah, and then I suppose the last thing for me really is this is supposed to be all really accessible to everyone. We have to get everyone on board with this kind of stuff. And I came into this. I'm going to say now I'm not an entomologist. Everyone knows this on the call, but I'm not. And I, I, I struggled at the beginning to kind of get my head around, you know, species and pitfall trapping. And actually a year in and it's like second nature to me. And I, I wouldn't, um, you know, it's, it's you, you really get into it once you start. Um, you just become obsessed with beetles and bumblebees and everything else. So, yeah, this needs to be accessible to everyone and make you realize it's, it's actually not that hard once you once you get your head around it. Um, so. Great, thank you. Um, and just to wrap up, we've got one final poll um, to gather your thoughts on, um, as a result of this webinar, um, how are you, what are you going to do next? Are you going to manage your farm as you always have? Are you going to make some changes or wait for further research before you make changes or do some more investigations yourself? coming in and David and Patrick as, as a result of this webinar are you going to try anything differently perhaps outside of the strategic farm trials I think I we think, need think, to sorry. why don't you go back there? I was just gonna say I think for me it's about making sure that every single bit of grass has flowers in um, and moving forwards, it's it's grass margins, it's um, other areas that are just historic rough grassland. It's making sure that everything has as much diversity in it as possible. Um, and for me, it's about learning. It's kind of getting into the position that Eva's in. It's getting excited about um, all the things previously that probably historically I wouldn't have looked at quite so um, quite so closely. But actually, making sure that we're recording everything we see. Um, and and have a record of all the benefits and making sure that we actually we know what's what's going on out there and we know what we're doing is working. Great. And David, so what are you going to say? Yeah, I, I agree with Patrick. I think um, start trying to get a bit more diversity into our strips and even there I say, although it sticks in my head a bit practically, is how we do it is start dividing up some of the larger fields that we have. Um, you know, the 50 and 60 acre fields or 20 and 24 hectares is a big area with nothing but margin around the outside. So how can we practically divide them up that we, we, we can live with and make the, the beneficial changes? Great. And it's great to see that so many people on the webinar, hopefully you can all see the results now, um, have also said that they are going to make some changes. Um, so thank you very much for everybody who's been involved today it's clearly had a, a very good impact um, so this brings us to the end of the webinar all of the um, results are available on the website we've not been able to go through everything today um, hopefully can you see my slides at the moment you're back to the poll Fiona okay um, hopefully now can you see it hopefully you can see the links now um, so all of the results are available on each of the farm's uh, web pages. Um, you may need to click the See More button, um, and then it will take you to each of the trials on the web on that website, and you can click through to the link then to see the full results from each trial 
happened this year and last year. If you've got any questions, you can, um, myself and Emily Pope, our details are on the screen at the moment. So feel free to contact us at any point um, so that we can, um, we can give you more information or answer any questions that you may have. The strategic farms are part of the wider farm excellence platform. Um, so this network of monitor farms and strategic farms is across the UK. Um, we've got just over 20 monitor farms at the moment, so hopefully there's one near you, and we would encourage you to attend some of those meetings in person over this winter. So this is day one of Strategic Farm Results Week. Uh, throughout the week, we'll have a different focus on each day. The webinars, uh, you can join those using the, um, the same web link that you found today. So that's ahtb.org.uk forward slash SF Week 2021. Uh, you can register to get the link to, um, to attend the webinars going through this week. So that leaves me just to say thank you to our speakers and thank you to you for joining us today. It's been great to see the questions coming in and to have a discussion on the results that we've seen. Um, so thank you very much and we hope to see you in the webinars later on this week.